Good morning, people of God. I, I know there's more energy than that in this room. Let's try it again. Good morning, people of God. Are you excited to be here? I'm excited to see actual live humans in front of me this morning. It is a joy to see those of you who are here in person. It is a joy to be leading those of you who are worshiping with us from home, whether you're doing it live via Zoom or uh, after the fact on our YouTube channel. I know we've had some Zoom glitches this morning, and so um, if you are someone who's tuning in from home and haven't yet caught this, uh, rest assured that we're doing our best and, and we're getting you on as fast as we can. Um, a few announcements before we begin our time of worship this morning. First, uh, I'll just draw your attention, those of you who are here in person or received the church email, to the announcements sheet that Nancy prepares for us. There's lots of great information there for you to read on your own time. I will also uh, just lift up that on Saturday, this coming Saturday, October 23rd, there's going to be a work day at the Parsonage. Um, and so if you are willing and able to go to the Parsonage on Saturday the 23rd to help with some of the, the work that needs to be done there, um, that would be much appreciated. Uh, just some background information for those who might not have have caught the the news yet. The Hughie family has moved out of the parsonage. We have a place of our own now. As it turns out, the bigger the family gets, the ha the smaller the house feels. And so, um, as our family continues to grow, we uh, we've found a place that's got a little more space to it. And so. Um, the parsonage will be listed for sale as soon as it is ready to, to be listed. Uh, there is a little bit of cleanup and maintenance and yard work and that kind of thing that needs to be done before it'll be ready to be put on the market, though. So that's what this work call is all about. I also have uh, an announcement here that's from last week, so never mind. Um, that's old. You never know what notes I'm going to find on my pulpit. Um, and just one more announcement about things that are kind of coming down the pike. I know um, I've, I've done the best I can to communicate maternity leave plans and that sort of thing. I have also, in 10 years of pastoring, never communicated something too much. So we're going we're gonna to go through this again, just for those who might not have all the details. Next Sunday, I will be leading you in worship. And that'll be the last thing I do before my mater maternity leave, as far as work goes, as far as church things go. My leave starts on Monday, October 25th. I will be out for 10 weeks, and so I'll be back in the pulpit the second Sunday in January, and back in the office before that. All of this information is available through the church office, and in the meantime, worship will continue at the same time, same place, whether that place is here in person if the, if the local infection rates allow, or whether it's um, from home if they don't. We have a series of guest preachers lined up that I am so excited uh, that you all get to worship with. Some of them are familiar names like Janine Beals and Bill Gottschalk Fielding, so you will see some familiar faces in the course of things. Um, Bill Duke, Faye's, Faye's brother-in-law, will be one of our, our guest preachers for a couple Sundays as well. And so we have lots and lots of really great preachers who will be coming in. Three of the district superintendents from the Upper New York Annual Conference are on, on the preaching slate as well. So please, I, I would strongly encourage you to not miss this opportunity to hear God's word brought to you through many different voices. As for pastoral care needs, things like hospital visits and nursing homes and those sorts of things, Janine will be taking care of all of that. So there will be good, steady, compassionate consistency in meeting the pastoral care needs. So as those needs arise, feel free either to reach out directly to Janine or if you're not sure how to do that, to reach out to the church office. I think that's it for announcements at this point. We will continue to determine on a week-to-week -week basis whether we'll be worshiping 
um, in a hybrid format like we are now or whether worship will be exclusively remotely. Um, that all depends, of course, on local infection rates and you'll always uh, be able to check the, the website that the church uses on Wednesday afternoon or Thursday morning prior to the Sunday of worship. If you have questions about that, again, you can reach out to the church office. Okay, I think that's it for announcements. I am excited to lead us in worship today. So let's turn our attention to the call to worship. It's responsive, and it's in your bulletin and on the screens. We are called together this day to praise God. The Lord will walk with us as we faithfully witness to Christ's love. Come, let us worship God. Amen. Would you stand in body or spirit to join in our opening hymn? See. Amen. Please be seated. And let us join our voices together in the opening prayer. Gracious God, mend our brokenness and our sadness. Give us spirits of joy and enthusiasm for service to you by serving others. Let us and place us on your pathways of peace and hope that with our lives we will witness to your redeeming love. Amen.
Amen. I invite our children to come join me. Did I jump the gun? No. Am I overly eager? <laughs> I do that sometimes. <laughs> I'm just so excited to hang with Peyton and Reagan. And with any children who are joining us from home. How are you two doing this morning? Peyton, how are you, bud? Good. I like your haircut. It's shorter since the last time I saw you. I like how it looks. Hmm? Awesome. We're getting ready for haircuts in our household, too. I got to work on that. Reminds me. So this whole, like, ever since the beginning of August, we've been doing a sermon series. It's called Ask Me Anything. And it's been a chance for people in the church to ask me, the pastor, questions that they have about God or religion or church or anything like that, the Bible, all of that. I thought maybe this morning I would give you a shot at answering the ask me anything question because I, I want to hear what your thoughts are. And then, I'll, and then I'll answer it too in my sermon in a little while. So today's question, is it better to give time or money or both? I want to hear what your thoughts are, Peyton and Reagan. Is it better to give time or money or both? What do you think? Oh, like money to, um, yeah, like oh. we know that Jesus wants us to be generous, right? Yeah. We know that God wants us to give like whatever we can to help other people, right? Yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I'm, just for those who are dependent on the microphone, I'm going to repeat what Reagan shared with us. She says, both, but if she had to pick just one or the other, and tell me if I say your words wrong, she said if we had to pick just one or the other, she would say time, because it's good to give money, but, but really giving our time and our love to people, that's, that makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Reagan says, Reagan says that, that giving your time, like with kindness and stuff, gets you, gets you farther, gets the other person farther, and, and makes both of you happy, usually. And one step to a better world. Yeah, it's, it's one important step to a better world. Peyton, do you want to weigh in on this? Is it better to give time or money or both? Money. Yeah, I mean, different people have different opinions on this. Do you have ideas why? That's okay. Money is a really powerful tool. And, you know, Peyton, to your credit, Jesus talked about giving money more than Jesus talked about just about any other subject. If you read the Gospels, do you two know what the Gospels are? They're the first four books in the New Testament, and they're the books that tell the stories of Jesus. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four books. Because Jesus wasn't born yet. Right, right. The Old Testament talks about Jesus coming, but they don't tell the stories of Jesus because when those books were written, Jesus wasn't born yet. Right, exactly. And so the first four books in the Bible are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the Gospels. They tell the stories of Jesus. And if you read the Gospels, you find out, we find out, that Jesus taught more about money and giving money than about just about any other subject. So I think you're both right. And I think that that's maybe the answer, that it's best to give both. I said both also. You did say both, yeah. Yeah, so it is a really hard question, and I think it's different in different circumstances too. Like if somebody, if somebody doesn't have any food to eat for the rest of the day, 
then the more immediate need is to buy them food, which means money, right? Mm-hmm. But if somebody's feeling really sad or down, their their more immediate need is time, right? That we sit with them and yeah. and help them feel better, comfort them. Yeah, exactly. I said both though, but I was like, maybe get Yeah, it's it's tricky. It's tricky to think our way through this. Well, like time. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think the fact that you and Peyton had different answers, that the two of you had different answers shows that this is a tricky question and that there maybe the best answer really is both. I mean, the question was, is it better to give time or money or both? And it sounds like the three of us together are settling on both, don't you think? <laughs> well, I mean, he's not wrong. Neither of you are wrong, right? So our challenge this week is to find a way to give time or money or things or our talents. Peyton has an extraordinary talent for making people laugh. His sense of humor is just amazing, right? So Peyton, that's something that you can give this week. That's a way you can give your time. Yeah, absolutely. Reagan, you have really good insights about people and what people need, and so that's a way you can give your time, right, is by looking around and finding people who, maybe there's a classmate who looks a little extra sad that day. You're welcome. And so our challenge this week is to look as much as we can to see where the needs are around us, and then to think, how can I help meet that need? So our two questions for our challenge this week, where do we see need and how can I help meet that need? And so that's what we're going to be about this week, all of us, all of God's people, is looking for needs and then figuring out how to meet them. Reagan, I'm going to step out on a limb. Do you want to lead our prayer today? Sure. Okay, here. Dear God, Thank you for giving us time and money. Thank you for giving us time and money. They both make us feel, you know, happy and better. They both make us feel happy and better. And they make us smile when you give both. And they make us smile when you give both. Thank you, God. We love you. Thank you, God. We love you. Amen. Amen. I'm proud of you, Reagan. <laughs> Good to see you too. Peyton, let me grab your mask. It's under your chair. There you go, bud. It's the light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Would you join your heart with mine in prayer? May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from one of the epistles, one of the letters that we find in the New Testament. This is from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. My friends, If anyone is detected in transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. All must test their own work. Then that work, rather than their neighbor's work, will become a cause for pride. For all must carry their own loads. Those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. 
Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. This is a message from God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I mentioned when I met with Peyton and Reagan just now and with our children tuning in from home that we are in the midst of a sermon series that's been ongoing since the beginning of August. This is the longest sermon series that I've ever participated in, and it's been so much fun. So just a super quick recap or to bring um, up to speed those folks that are new to our community this day. Uh, the sermon series is called Ask Me Anything, and I invited members of the faith community, all members of the faith community, to submit to me their questions about all things related to faith, religion, Bible, church, anything, anything pertinent um, in that way. I expected to get about a month's worth of questions. I ended up with three months' worth of questions, and since then, a few more have come in that I won't have a chance to address uh, before I go on leave, but I will hopefully get to them after the fact. So with so many questions, we broke them down into chapters. We had our first chapter on biblical foundations. A lot of those questions had to do with how the Bible was formed and how we, how we read and interpret the Bible, that sort of thing. The second sort of chapter was about human suffering. A lot of questions came in about why God allows suffering to happen and what a faithful Christian response to suffering might be. After that, we had several questions that, that did not surprise me. The, the third chapter was questions about heaven and hell and salvation. These are questions that many of us are, are asking ourselves right up until the moment we die. And now we're in our final chapter, which is about how we live our faith out in our day-to-day -day lives. So we're, we're in the living out our faith chapter of the sermon series. Which brings us to today's question, which you heard when I asked the children, is it better to give time or money or both? Is it better to give time or money or both? I think that I think that Peyton and Reagan and I agreed that it's probably better to give both, and, and I think the scriptures support that, but there's some nuance there that we can get into. See, it, the answer is both in part become, because it comes in different measures for different individuals. It, it, different people are called to give generously in different ways based on who they are and what they have available and what the needs around them are and the work that God calls each of us to. What the scriptures tell us with more clarity, though, is that what really matters most when it comes to giving is the spirit in which it happens. What matters most when it comes to giving is the spirit in which it happens. Now, there are many, many, many passages that I could have chosen to address today's question. Like I taught Peyton a few minutes ago, Jesus spoke more about money than about any other subject. If we read through the Gospels, he spoke more about money than about any other single subject. So, so I could have chosen any one of those passages. Not, not just with Jesus, although just with Jesus would be enough, but generosity is actually one of the strongest overarching themes that we find throughout the whole Bible, the New Testament and Old alike. In the Old Testament, one of the, one of the sins that is most consistently and most fervently admonished is a failure of hospitality, 
a failure of giving of one's time and resources to meet the needs of others. Whether those others be weary travelers or strangers in a foreign land or refugees or slaves or neighbors or friends or family, one of the sins that is most often and most fervently admonished in the Old Testament is a failure of giving to meet the needs of others, a failure of hospitality. Then, again, in the New Testament, many of the conversations Jesus has, not just about life in general, but about specifically how to be a participant in the kingdom of heaven, how to be a recipient of eternal life, Many of those conversations focus on generosity. And then when we get into the epistles, those letters that teach churches how to be holy faith communities, many of those are focused on extravagant generosity too. Generosity, whether of time or of money or of both, is a pervasive theme throughout all of Scripture. So then why did I choose this text in particular? Well, first, I couldn't find any texts that directly answered the question. There's no place in the Bible where you can open up and read that um, so-and-so in first whatever, chapter 7, said it's better to give time than money, or it's better to give money than time, or both are equally as good. The answer is not directly found in the scriptures. And even if it were, I'm guessing that that would be one of those contextual teachings. Remember, we talk about how some teachings in the scriptures were contextual and others were meant to be applied universally. And even then, speaking of context, we are each living in our own unique individual contexts, which make it so that the answer to the question at hand may be different for each of us. So in all of this grayness, again, what matters most is the spirit in which the giving happens. What matters most is the spirit in which giving happens. So what does this text say about that? Our focus verse for this morning will be verse 2, where we read, Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, those of you who have heard me preach a handful of times know that I am often looking for ways to simplify my understanding of how God would want me to live and how God would want the church to carry out her mission. This is why my all-time favorite passage in Scripture is the greatest commandment. Many of you who who know me um, a little bit know that this is the case because the greatest commandment boils everything down to love God and love neighbors keeps it nice and simple. Not easy, but simple. This might be my second favorite verse for the very same reason. The verse doesn't say one of the hundreds of components of the law of Christ is to bear one another's burdens, or if you bear one another's burdens, then then you'll have checked off one box in the law of Christ. No, this verse says bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill Fulfill the law of Christ. Fulfill. Bearing each other's burdens is central to the fulfillment of the law of Christ. We cannot fulfill the law of Christ without bearing one another's burdens. It's as simple as that. We bear each other's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. Simple, but not easy. So one of the first questions that we need to ask ourselves when we're looking to bear one another's burdens is, well, which burdens? Which burdens should we bear? And, and I would say that the short answer is all of them. Um, but if we want to get more contextually specific for where we are here and now, we actually have a fairly clear answer to this question from our own community in which we live. 
Last winter, as part of our visioning process, a team of volunteers from the church interviewed roughly 60 community leaders and members and asked them what they perceived to be the greatest needs of the community. Their answers were clear, consistent, and powerful. Food, housing, childcare, transportation, opportunity, both economic opportunity and educational opportunity, understanding across different cultures and different ideologies and such, and space, physical spaces for groups to gather. Food, housing, childcare, transportation, opportunity, understanding, and space. These are the real and immediate burdens that our neighbors are carrying. And so if, if we understand the fulfillment of the law of Christ to be predicated upon our bearing of one another's burdens, then, then it makes sense that we must address these particular burdens head on. But how? John Wesley taught and lived in his own life that, that bearing others' burdens happens both individually and collectively. That individually, we can each start by building relationships with others in the community, not just those in our church, but others in the community. We can do this by volunteering, by joining clubs or groups, by participating in local government, whether it just means observing city council meetings, I watch them on YouTube a day or two afterwards each time they happen, or by writing letters, or by running for office if we feel so called. We, we can start building relationships with others in the community. That's the first step to bearing each other's burdens. The second step would be to ask, to simply ask around. There are already so many efforts underway all around the community to meet the needs of the people. Things like Blueprint Geneva, Geneva 2030, the Center of Concern, the Community Lunch Program, Family Promise, even asking school nurses and school counselors, they have a really great sense of what the needs of the community are. We can start sharing one another's burdens, or rather bearing each other's burdens, by building relationships with those in the community. And then by asking around to learn what the needs are, and then when we find out what those needs are, to give directly to meet those needs. That's all stuff we can each do individually. That's all stuff we should each do individually. Beyond that, there's, there's power in, in collectively bearing one another's burdens, too. I love one of the stories I love best from Jesus' ministry is the story of the boy who brought his lunch and Jesus made it available to 5,000 people. Collectively, when we come together in the presence of God and, and by the power of Christ, our efforts are multiplied beyond what we can imagine. And so collectively, it's time for us as a church to look at ways that we can bear one another's burdens. We can do this internally. The work of the Connect team is all about this. We can also do this externally by, by looking together at the needs that the community has verbalized and seeing how we can either A, support local organizations that are already meeting those needs, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, or B, working together as a faith community to meet needs that are yet unmet. I've told a story before about a colleague who was pastoring a church that was the, the, the church itself was dying. They were down to about six members total, um, and, and those six members could barely pay enough in their, in their giving to keep the lights on at the church and to keep the property up. And so their pastor sat down with them and said, okay, church, we know this church is dying. We know it's going to be shut down soon. Very different from the context we have here. Um, very, very different context. 
But the pastor said to them, church is shutting down anyway. What would you like to do before that happens? And they said, well, pastor, we've always, we've always wanted to paint our building. The outside of it is looking drab and shabby and kind of run down, and, and, and we've always just wanted to kind of spruce it up. And the pastor said to them, I mean, why not? You might as well go for it. And so they painted their building. And their tiny little community that they were in started to take notice that, that the building looked different. Not much happened after that until one day the pastor sat down with them again and said, okay, you've painted your building. What else is on your bucket list as a faith community? What else would you like to do before the church shuts its doors? And they said, well, we've noticed that in our community there are a lot of low-income single mothers. And we know that, that there are like food ministries and stuff that they can go to a food bank and, and get me- needs met there, but there's no one getting diapers for them and wipes and, and the, the other stuff that uh, young mothers need to raise their children that, that aren't often found at food pantries. We, we really just want to start a ministry to help meet the needs of the, the young single mothers in our community. And the pastor said, I mean... Why not? You might as well go for it. And so each of them pitched in a little bit and solicited donations from their friends and got a few shelves full of bags of diapers, boxes of diapers, um, and, and started to make them available to people in the community. Well, the women in the community who needed them started to come and build relationships with the six people who were left in the church. And the six people who were left in the church started to um, share God's love with them, not in like aggressive sort of banging you over the head with a Bible sorts of ways, but just by loving them, plain and simple. And, and the women who would come, who would not only receive diapers, but would also receive love, started to say, you know, maybe, maybe I should start coming back to church. I used to go as a child, and I just haven't been in a while, but but maybe I should go back to church. And they started attending church. The church grew. The church reestablished itself. The church became vibrant and vital and alive and full of life and joy and service, all because a group of people within the church gave with reckless abandon. They had reached the point where they had said, you know, None of us individually can solve this problem of of poverty. None of us individually can meet all of the needs of all of the young mothers in our community. But collectively, we could do a thing. We could do a thing that's powerful and meaningful and significant to our neighbors. And so they did. Beloved, we can do a thing. We, as a faith community, can do a much, much bigger thing even than those six people were able to accomplish. And so working together to bear the burdens of those in our community is something to which we as a faith community are urgently called. Already our leadership team has been working on setting some goals for 2022 um, for how we, can, how we can go about doing this. Goals like establishing a whole brand new faith community in Geneva. Goals like holding events here in the building as much as COVID safety allows. Um, events designed to leverage our great and beautiful and extraordinary facility to meet the needs of our neighbors, even to create a facility leverage team, if you will. Our neighbors have told us that they need spaces to gather. They need opportunities. And so we have space to create those opportunities. Even beyond that, we have our five ongoing ministry teams that we would love to have you be a part of. We have our building maintenance team, the team, the team commissioned with the responsibility of keeping this space as wonderful as it is. We have a worship team, a connect team, a learn team, and a serve team. 
And when we as a faith community all work together, bind together to, to bear one another's burdens both within the local congregation and throughout our community, not only do we do extraordinary things for our community and for our church, but we fulfill the law of Christ when we work together to bear one another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. We said at the beginning of all of this that the spirit of sharing, the spirit of giving is what matters most. And so a few things to bear in mind along those lines. Bearing burdens is as heavy as it sounds. Bearing burdens cannot co simply consist of a little a little money thrown here or 10 minutes thrown there. Bearing burdens must involve a willingness for us to open our hearts to hear and hold space for the real fear and pain and need that is around us. We must be willing to make ourselves vulnerable in that way. And we must be willing to share to a degree where our neighbor's burden becomes no greater than our own. Whether that means giving of our time, or money, or both, it means extravagant generosity. It means taking up our crosses to follow Jesus. It means becoming a bit uncomfortable in earthly things in order to experience the greatest of heavenly joys. Church, I believe that we can do this. I believe that we must do this. I feel just as much urgency now as I heard Jesus communicate in his words 2,000 years ago, just as much urgency now as I heard Paul communicate in his letter to the Galatians not long after that, that we must bear one another's burdens to fulfill the law of Christ. The good news is this. When we fulfill the law of Christ, we reap all of the benefits of being part of the family of God. When we fulfill the law of Christ, we find life abundant, we find joy overflowing, we find peace we didn't know existed, we find hope, beloved. And who couldn't use some more hope in their lives these days? So let's do it individually, collectively, let's see what can be possible when we fulfill the law of Christ by bearing one another's burdens with the giving of our time, our talents, our gifts, our service, and our witness, just as we're called to in our membership vows. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you stand and body your spirit to join in song?
Amen. Please be seated. One of the ways that we bear one another's burdens is by holding space for prayer with and for one another. I am not recalling any joys or concerns that were communicated to me throughout the week, but I'll just lift up a few that I know of. We have a few people either in our faith community or closely connected with our faith community who are uh, facing some medical concerns, some medical procedures, that sort of thing. Um, And so we will hold each of them in prayer. We also know that we are to continue in prayer for all of those who are working in the school system, all of those who are connected to schools in any way, that, that public education throughout our country seems to be burdened in different ways in different places, whether through staffing shortages or COVID protocols or whatever else might be going on. There are a lot of burdens to be borne there. I'm waiting just a moment in case anyone says, Pastor, you forgot mine. Some joys to celebrate. We celebrate the, uh, <laughs> the joy that the Hughie family is moved into our new place. We still have lots and lots and lots and lots of boxes to unpack, but we're there and we're, we're finding our footing there. I celebrate the joy of the volunteer efforts and the efforts of our staff here as we prepare for, um, for my maternity leave, that it feels really, really good to be able to step away and spend some time Uh, with my family and enjoying new life in my home as it comes without having to worry too much about uh, what's going on here. So I'm, I'm grateful I celebrate the work that you all are doing to make that possible. Let's take a few moments then to come before God in prayer. God of love, we start this day by giving you praise. May it be that every time we come before you, O God, we start by giving you praise. For doing so reminds us of who and whose we are. Doing so reminds us, more importantly, of who you are. You are perfect, O God. You are holy, you are awesome, you are powerful, you are good. Best of all, you are love. We confess, O God, that we are not always quick to love, that we often struggle with bearing one another's burdens and in that way fulfilling Christ's law. We confess, O God, that we are fearful, that we can be selfish at times, that we find it difficult to trust you When we trust you completely, O God, we can step out boldly in faith, knowing that we, by the power of your Spirit, can accomplish all to which you have called us. We confess, O God, that we have not always that courage rooted in trust. Even so, we give you thanks, for we know that you have forgiven us, that you forgive us this day, and that you will continue to forgive us into the future. We know that your grace is abundant, that your mercy is vast, that your love is complete and boundless. We give you thanks, for we know that nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from your love, O God. We thank you for the fellowship we find here, for the friendship we enjoy with one another, for the faith that has grown in this place and through our daily lives. We give you thanks for all of the blessings with which you've blessed us, for a community that does work to bear one another's burdens and for the opportunity to do so for others as well. We pray for our neighbors, O God, our neighbors here and throughout the world. We pray for those who are ill or injured, in mind, in body, 
or in spirit, that your healing touch may be upon them. We pray for those who are grieving, whether it be a fresh grief or a grief that never ends, that your comfort may wrap around them. We pray for those who are living in fear, in violence, that you would protect them. And for those living in scarcity, in poverty, that you would provide for them. We pray for the imprisoned, the oppressed, the addicted, that you would free them. And we pray for us, O oh God, individually, collectively, that we would be a part of bringing about all that for which we have just prayed. Inspire us, encourage us, embolden us, O oh God, to truly, fully bear one another's burdens here and throughout the community. All of these things we pray in the precious name of Jesus who bore our burdens. Amen. And so, beloved, we live out our prayer that we might bear one another's burdens by giving back a bit of that which has been given to us. Amen. Please be seated as we join our voices together in the prayer of dedication followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render all that we have and all that we are 
that we may praise you, not with our lips only, but with our whole lives, turning the duties, the sorrows, and the joys of all our days into a living sacrifice to you, through Jesus, Jesus Christ. Amen. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray as he taught us, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand and body your spirit one more time as we sing the servant song. Amen. Please be seated to receive these words of blessing and the blessing of the music to follow. Let this be our prayer today. That, Lord, as we go from this place, you would surround us with your peace and love, that we may take healing and hope to others in your holy name as we bear one another's burdens and fulfill your law. Amen.